Welcome to stage two uh, of the product life cycle of a garment and the raw materials stage in which we're going to ask the question, what materials should I use to make my garments? So to set us in the mood, I thought I'd show you this little video and I'll discuss it. In its doctors in all parts of the country, doctors in every branch of medicine were asked, what cigarette do you smoke, doctor? In this nationwide survey of general practitioners, surgeons, growth specialists, diagnosticians, and so on, the brand named most was Camel. In the 1950s, some leading medical experts were skeptical that smoking was a major factor in lung cancer. In the words of one researcher from the National Cancer Institute, if excessive smoking actually plays a role in the production of lung cancer, it seems to be a minor one. Yes, according to this survey, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. Okay. So the point of that is to say that the norms of the 1950s are no longer the norms of today. So what we practice today in the fashion industry may not necessarily be normal uh, practice going forward in the future. And as I suggested a few weeks ago, as we're transitioning uh, throughout the world and particularly in our industry, we need to be open-minded to, to new ways of doing things, including the type of raw materials that we're going to use. So what's old perhaps may not be permanent. A bit of a recap from the last few weeks, just so uh, we refresh our memories. What was the problem? The problem is the notion of having to balance, balance in this time of transition. And the more we understand the world around us, the more we're able to keep our balance and sort of negotiate our way through our career and our lives in general. And there were three things we looked at, the growing population around the world, this divide between the haves and have nots on the planet, which is, which is growing, and a philosophy that suggests that affluence is the only way in which we live. And so by gaining and collecting material goods and consuming those material goods, we live a full and rich life. Um, the suggestion is that these three, along with other issues, present themselves as wicked problems because of the it's simply untenable to continue uh, along that path without some sort of tensions occurring in there. In the midst of that, we've got the fourth industrial revolution. There's another YouTube clip there. I won't go through it. In uh, where we ask ourselves, what role will technology play in the industry of the future? All told, it's part of the age of the Anthropocene, where we as human beings will influence the world around us. So the traditional model, once again, looks at a pretty simplistic idea. Your business is a success if you make a profit through sales, and your business is a failure or is in trouble if um, your costs are too high. So obviously the objective is to get your costs down and your profits up. A business model in the 21st century is a little bit more complex because it is holistic in its nature. It not only looks at profit and loss, because they're important, but it also takes into account what impact it's going to have on the Earth's ecosystems. And we've looked at the nine planetary boundaries as a way to measure that impact. And then it also looks at what impact we have on human beings, both negative and positive. And we used Kate Raworth's Donut Economics as the framework to ask those questions by, you know, by creating this range of garments this season, did we improve the lives of people? Uh, did we create opportunities of people or did we simply exploit people and make their life more miserable? So we're in the midst now of forming or looking at different companies that are coming up with more progressive ways of measuring success in the brand. So last week we commenced our journey of the product life cycle with the idea of conceptualization and the notion that before you even think about or before you even start sketching a range, you have to consider where you're physically located when you do that because the physical location can influence your design and your thinking. The physical space, the actual building itself, what room you're in, because different rooms will generate different atmospheres and different feelings. And all told, 
all of that has to occur within a, a very clear understanding of the philosophy of the company, which, as I said, is a little bit more than a mission statement. It's actually uh, having a really innate understanding of the brand of the company and what it represents. And if you get those three right, then you're off to a good start because you you the the what you're what you're putting on paper, the design you're putting on paper, uh, may in fact be something quite unique out there in the market. So today we're going to look at raw materials and I'm going to do it again. I think we've covered this one, so I won't go through it again. We're going to look at it uh, from a number of different perspectives. So it's the second stage. So we've decided on our, our range or we've sketched our range. Now we have to go out and make a decision about what materials we're going to make the garments out of. Uh, you studied materials last year and basically in a very simplistic form it was divided between natural and synthetic fibres that's being morphed now with all these uh, new fibres out on the market including mycelium, um, fibres that they grow in laboratories etc. But for now, we're going to stick to these two basic ones. So we can take what we call the so-called natural fibres, which are naturally occurring in the ecosystem without any assistance from humans, or we can create them in a laboratory and synthetic. And if we look at it from a global perspective, what we find, if you look at the on the left-hand side, in terms of world consumption of natural and man-made fibres, synthet synthetics dominate the industry followed um, closely by cotton, which takes up the other big proportion. So cellulose fibres and wool make up a pretty insignificant portion of the current industry. But as that cigarette um, commercial at the start suggested, that might be the picture today. Will that be the picture tomorrow? And given the rate of change, we need to be prepared that the industry may in fact switch over to something else entirely, or perhaps switch into cellulose or go back to wool, uh, we don't know. But what we can assume is perhaps that that pie chart in its current configuration may not uh, last into the future. On the right hand side, we can see the countries which dominate um, man-made fibre industry and, and natural fibre industry. And obviously, the standout there is China, followed by other Asia, which is by and large India, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. So when we look at this stage of the product life cycle of a garment and raw materials, we're looking to see the trends in China and India and Pakistan, both in the current market and also where they're uh, putting their money into research. Because those, those players, those countries will influence what the industry looks like in the future. So we currently have a world of synthetics dominated by China and India predominantly. And obviously, hopefully, you've already made the, the, the connection with synthetics and that is the disposal of them, which we'll talk about a bit later on. Now, the, for the purposes of this lecture, we can't go through all of the materials. So I'm just going to focus on one, one of the natural ones, and that's cotton. And we're going to look at that one in, in depth just to give you a broader understanding. And then from that, hopefully you can extrapolate uh, into other raw materials later on in your working careers. So the first questions we have to ask ourselves is who owns the seeds? You can go for a walk into a forest and you might see a seed on the ground and you might pick it up, take it home and plant it and watch it germinate, just like this one is here in the image. The question is, do you have a right to do it? Is that your seed or does it belong to someone else? And the answer is, depends. If we have a look at this uh, list of the top 10 seed companies in the world, you'll, you'll find that they have a significant amount of sales, starting with Monsanto, which has recently been purchased by Bayer Germany. So it has sales of $4.9 billion worth of seeds, or 23% of the global seed market. DuPont, Syngenta, 
uh, etc. These are all companies which own seeds that you may not necessarily be able to pick off the ground, take home and plant yourself. The first thing I want to note with this list is the country of origin of these companies. What you might, might notice from Germany to the US, France, Switzerland, Denmark, Japan, is they are all in the developed world. And this is our first contentious point that we'll, we'll sort of discover is some of the wealthiest countries on earth own the right to seeds and they they stop you from planting those seeds how do they do that how do they say this is my seed and not your seed they genetically modif modify them so they take let's say a cotton seed that that is naturally occurring in the environment they'll put it in the laboratory they'll splice it manipulate it change the DNA code of it, slight change in it, and say, this is our creation. This is our invention. Much like a designer would take a traditional design or a generic design, a garment such as a t-shirt, tweak it in some way and, and declare it their own unique design. Now, why do they do that? They do it to make the seed resistant to pesticides. So what happens is they genetically modify this seed they then sell that to the farmer and along with that they sell the pesticide which you spray on it and what it, the pesticide does is it'll kill everything else in the field except for that one seed which is being designed to be resistant to it so it's a nice neat solution sell the seed sell the pesticide the end result is efficiency in the yield you get a lot more cotton as a result of that um, the problem with that is not so much from the efficiency point of view, but from the human point of view. So if we look at Kate Raworth's uh, donor economics, you'll notice I've circled a number of her criteria there uh, required to move out of critical human de deprivation to make sure someone's living in the safe and just space for humanity. And what we find is that genetically modified seeds has had an impact on a number of farmers around the world, from both the developed world and the developing world. And as I say, this is a, a, a pretty contentious issue. Now, obviously, if you're not a farmer, if you don't live in, uh, in rural Australia or rural anywhere in the world, you may not be aware of this issue. You simply go to the supermarket and buy your food. Um, but there's been a significant change that has occurred and I'll just show you a couple of minutes of this this um, YouTube clip of an American farmer and then I'll just talk about it father's grave right over here. Monsanto sued him in 2003 for saving their soybeans, which he did not do. He never grew a soybean in his life. Growing their seed, he, he didn't do it. Oh. I'll just pause it there for a moment. He said Monsanto sued his father for growing a soybean because um, here's one of the problems is if, if farmer A is growing genetically modified crop, so in this case soybeans, if the wind blows those soybeans onto another farmer's property uh, and it happens to grow, what was occurring in the United States is companies like Monsanto were extremely aggressive at going to those farmers and saying, you're growing my seeds and I'm going to sue you for them and pay, basically putting them out of business. The farmer was saying, well, I didn't plant it. It just blew in there. And what the courts decided was it doesn't matter if it's if you own land and a gene genetically modified seed happens to blow onto your land, you're responsible to make sure that you, you cut it or you kill it before it grows, not the farmer with the genetically modified crop. So it, it, it was um, a tension between the new ways of agricultural production and the more traditional 
ways of agricultural production. And the law seemed to be on the side of the more efficient and innovative genetically modified crops. And in so doing, it destroyed the lives of many of these farmers who are quite, quite rightly proud and independent and found themselves up against these large corporations. As far as we could tell, he's the oldest man in the world to ever have been sued for saving seed since God created seed. He's probably the only farmer to ever beat Monsanto hands down. Even after the lawsuit was over, uh, I couldn't make him believe it was over. He would cry and keep saying, that, oh, they're going to come back and, and sue me again. It destroyed him. It destroyed his life. Uh, just as a side issue, I thought I'd, uh, I'd just point out here, you know, um, let's just dabble our fingers in politics a bit. It's easy to criticise the people who vote for Donald Trump as being mad or redneck or whatever the case may be. But uh, a lot of Donald Trump's support comes out of these states and out of these situations. And it's, it's a lot about the disempowerment of individuals who feel so enraged that they've got no one else to vote for, so they vote for Donald Trump. Um, which helps sort of tr explain the rage and the tension in the US at the moment because of this um, uh, impact that's had on humans' lives. As I said before, it hasn't happened just in the United States. Also in India, it's been a significant problem where there, uh, some argue there has been increase in Indian suicide rates because Indian farmers also started buying these seeds from Monsanto, so the, or from companies like Monsanto. The, the, the problem slight, was slightly different in India is that once you buy seeds from that company, remember you can't collect the seeds from your crop and plant them next year. You have to go back to the company and buy a new lot of seeds for the year after. And in the short term, Indian farmers were very prosperous because the yields were much, much better. But what started to occur was that the Indian farmers became dependent on these seed suppliers. And obviously seed suppliers started putting up their prices, um, or started directing them as to which seeds they were going to sell them. And so these, again, these independent farmers now found themselves dependent or locked in to these large corporations. and. Many went broke, partly because, you know, to buy these seeds, uh, they don't want to be paid in rupees, they want to be paid in US dollars. So Indian farmers have to find US dollars or other hard currencies like the euros or the yen to pay for these expensive seeds. And depending on exchange rates and everything else could Im impact on them. So you saw, as I said, um, Indian farmers that had been practicing uh, their, their art, their craft, their ways of life for, for thousands of years, all of a sudden becoming unstuck with this new technology that was out there and creating a degree of critical human deprivation as well. So for us uh, in the fashion industry, it's about thinking about, you know, what if we are to use cotton, for instance, which seeds is that cotton going to come from? We have to start making those decisions. If we look closer to home in Australia, the same thing happened here in West Australia in a famous case where you had two, uh, two friends. They grew up together in West Australia. They had farms next to each other. One went down the path of organic. The other one went down the path of organic uh, genetically modified crops. And uh, the genetically modified seeds blew over into the organic farmer's crop. Now, as soon as there's a, a genetically modified seed on an organic farm, that farm can no longer be declared as organic. So you lose, you lose the, um, the label of being uh, uh, organic. So you had that problem from the organic farmer's perspective. Then, then you had the company who supplied these seeds who saw these crops being 
grown on the organic farm wanting compensation from the organic farmer saying um, that the farmer shouldn't have been growing their seeds because the farmer obviously didn't pay for them. So again, the same sort of tension point here. And the court ruled in favour of the genetically modified seed supplier in that case. It was overturned later on in on appeal, but it highlighted the case, this tension between uh, the fact that seeds can blow around and nobody can control the seeds and whose obligation it is to then control those seeds. What we do know about uh, GM crops, genetically modified crops, is that it's a, a novel entity. It's a new entity created by humans and we don't know what impact it has on throughout the entire supply chain and also through the ecosystem in the long term because these these seeds have never been seen before. More re recently, um, genetic modification has evolved into what they call terminator genes. So now scientists are making genes which destroy themselves basically or become extinct within perhaps a season or two seasons. And they basically do that by, by either turning them all into male or most of the seeds into male or most into female. So they don't have the capacity to reproduce the year after. And Brazil was one of the first countries in the world to accept these terminated genes. And again, once again, it's this tension between developed and developing world. You know, it would be harder to get these gene drive mechanisms or terminated genes into, say, Australia or the United States or the European Union because there'd be a lot more protest. So what these companies do is they find a government which is more susceptible to accepting um, uh, what these corporations are offering and so people in the developed world say well are we are we the experiment for the world are we the ones that need to to have all of these things tried on us and so there's quite quite a, a lot of kickback from it from farmers in brazil at the moment again this is pro this one the criticism to gene drive mechanisms is we don't know what happens uh in the future and therefore should we be a little bit more cautious before we introduce these new new ones in there now i'll show you uh, there's so there's obviously this pro, I, I don't want to bias it one way or, or the other because there's pros and cons to both of them um let's have a so we'll have a quick look at these two arguments just to sort of help you round out your views perhaps or consider your views on these issues of the environment so i don't think i like gmos actually gmos are one of the best tools farmers have to help protect and preserve our water air land and even limit the impact of climate change i don't know that's not what i hear please let me explain gmos are one of several plant breeding technologies that help farmers grow more food using less inputs like pesticides and land in fact during the last 20 years, GMOs have reduced pesticide applications by more than 8% and increased crop yields by 22%. This increased yield means farmers kept 48 million acres of land from agricultural production, decreasing potential deforestation and harm to ecosystems. Without GMO seeds, we'd need to convert the equivalent of almost all of our U.S. national parks to farmland to get the same amount of yield. GMOs also help improve air quality. GMO crops allow farmers to till their fields less often, using less tractor fuel and releasing less trapped CO2 in the soil, reducing carbon emissions by 58.8 .8 billion pounds. That's like removing nearly 12 million cars from the road for a whole year. GMOs also help reduce water pollution. Less soil tilling means better moisture retention in the soil and reduced runoff saving more than 6,400 bodies of water from clogging by soil, crop residue, and chemicals. GMOs benefit not only the environment, but also our daily lives. Without them, we'd have increased CO2 emissions, crop yield declines, and a major loss of forest and pasture land. Overall, less sustainability in how we grow food. Thanks, this is great information, but I still have a lot of questions. If you want to learn more, just check out GMOanswers.com. So, 
that's one side of the argument and then I'll just give you the other side again just briefly I'll just uh, introduce this uh, David Suzuki he he was um, a scientist in 1980s and 90s who was instrumental in sort of raising awareness of of the environmental issues in general um, so let's just listen to his perspective on this David Suzuki joins me in the studio. I'll, I'll just, the reason I'm showing you David Suzuki, I, sh I just want you to be aware of, of him. He was, he's a Canadian scientist who in the 80s and 90s was instrumental in raising awareness of uh, environmental issues globally. And so was one of, the, one of the key catalysts at that stage or key players in sort of uh, getting people to think about how we how we treat the earth and how we relate to the earth but again i'll just show you a couple of minutes of this david suzuki joins me in the studio i want to ask you first you've described our consumption of genetically modified food as a massive experiment that's what science is about experiments what's your primary concern about this one well the point i make is that we have no idea what the long-term consequences of these genetic manipulations will will be on the public there is no way that our health authorities can test all possible combinations and permutations over a large enough population over a long enough period to be able to say with a surety that they're harmless. So basically by slipping it into our food without our knowledge, without any indication that there are genetically modified uh, organisms in our food, we are now unwittingly part of a massive experiment. Over years, as thousands and thousands of people continue to consume this, we will provide the data which will allow us ultimately to conclude whether or not there's any danger. In approving the foods that it has, Health Canada says that they've looked for toxins and allergens, but that it essentially at the end of it, a potato is a potato, and if it doesn't have either one of those things in it, it's, it's safe. Yes. Why isn't it? Well, es essentially the U.S. FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, has said that genetically modified organisms or, or food are basically not much different from regular food, and so they'll be treated in the same way. The problem is this. Geneticists follow the inheritance of genes in what we call a vertical fashion. You breed a male and a female, you follow their offspring, you breed them, you follow it on down, within a species. What biotechnology allows us to do is to take genes from this organism and move it, what we call horizontally, into a totally unrelated species. Now, David Suzuki doesn't normally mate with a carrot plant and exchange genes. What biotechnology allows us to do is to switch genes from one to the other without regard to the biological constraints. Now, I mean, you're a geneticist. You know this field better than, right. than any of us. Why is that of particular concern? Well, the problem is this. You see, it's very, very bad science. We assume that the principles governing the inheritance of genes vertically applies when you move genes laterally or horizontally. There's absolutely no reason to, to make that conclusion. We've got to do much more experimentation and yet we're dealing with such small small bits oh sure <laughs> but one of those small bits can determine the difference between whether you're in in a human being a mutation can determine whether you're crippled or you die i mean because they're tiny a tiny part of it doesn't mean they are not potent and the point is when you move a gene one gene one tiny gene as you say out of this organism into a different one you change completely its context and there is no way at the present time that we can predict how that's going to behave and what the outcome will be. We think that we're designing these life forms, but it's like taking uh, a, the Toronto Symphony Orchestra prepared to play a Beethoven symphony, and then you take some Tycho drummers over here, and you flip them over in with the Toronto Symphony, and you say, play music. Well, what comes out is going to be something very, very different from either the Tycho drums by themselves or the symphony. Presumably this science is well motivated. They're doing this for the right reasons, whether they say it's to reduce the use of pesticides, to be able to um, improve crop yields, um, to be able to, I suppose, fight pests and bugs in our foods in, in other ways. What's the answer? I mean, Well, the, the, that's what the publicists say, is that it's being driven for all of these good things. The fact of the matter is it's being driven by money. Tremendous amount of money, speculative money, invested in biotech companies now, and so there's a tremendous amount of pressure to realize some kind of income on that investment so you can, uh, you can have some real economic exchange here. 
So it's money that's driving it. You know, they say that it, it, it's to help deal with the, uh, with the huge population growth. Well, Wolfen, uh, Wolfenson, the uh, president of the World Bank, says that 1.3 billion human beings live on less than a dollar a day. Three billion people, half the human population, lives on less than three dollars a day. Do you think they're going to be able to afford the very expensive genetically engineered foods? A great deal, more than half of the products, say, of Monsanto, are seeds that are generated not to produce more nourishment or to be better tasting, uh, but to allow these plants to be drenched with Monsanto pesticides. Normally those pesticides would kill the grain or the crop, but now they've engineered them to be resistant to those and they demand to have the Monsanto product put on them. So it's a... So, that, I mean, that gives you an idea of, of the two perspectives, whether it's efficiency gained by the genetically modified crops, uh, whether we as a species uh, adapt to this new technology um, that's available to us. After all, technology does and has improved our lives uh, since day dot, one could argue. Or should we perhaps be wary of the GM material? It's up to you as an individual and, uh, and a brand to decide where they choose to position themselves on it. Um, if you're interested in this topic at all for your own personal use, there's a couple of videos here that go your full, you know, a full hour, hour and a half that um, go into it in a lot more detail. Just click on the cotton one or the YouTube clip there to view those. Okay, another video we're going to look at here, uh, and that's the seed vault up at Svalbard, which is close to the North Pole. And again, once again, only goes for a couple of minutes, but just to, uh, to introduce you in to how serious the issue of seeds are and what governments are doing about it, or certainly the Norwegian government is doing about it. Glittering like an exotic gem in the distance. The entrance to the Svalbard seed vault extends out of the side of an Arctic mountain, looking more like a villain's lair from a James Bond movie than where humanity has banked the seeds of its survival. We walk into a long cement foreboding hallway. Safety helmets line the wall, protection against falling ice. So that's about 150 meters down into the mountain. This is becoming the permafrost here in granite. And down Michael there, Koch we'll with the, the crop trust that oversees the vault guides us deeper into the mountain. With each step, the temperature drops. It's like something out of a movie. It is like a holy place. Every time I come here, I feel like I'm in a cathedral. This is a place to pause and to think because it's a very unique place and it's a very important place for humanity. This is so beautiful and yet it's so simple. It's just a door, but behind it is the key to humanity's salvation. There are 860,000 types of seeds from all over the world here. So you get boxes from Germany, from Nigeria, from India, the United States, the largest gene bank in the world. That's an interesting box right here. Uh, this box comes from the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, the only wooden boxes in the vault. This is humanity's insurance policy, meant to safeguard against cataclysmic events that wipe out our crops. Despite multiple conflicts around the world, Koch says that's not what will bring about our demise. The agriculture is not adapting as fast currently as the climate is changing on us. We have to adapt to rising temperatures, to uh, wind and storm and flooding, new diseases and pests. We have salt water coming into the rice paddies in the fields, so salination is an issue. So these tolerances to these issues are found here. This is the di diversity of the genes that you're going to use to adapt agriculture. And you do not know what you're going to need 50 or 100 or 500 years from now. Even if power goes out, the vault can preserve these seeds for decades. In the race against climate change, Protecting our past may be the only way to ensure our future. Arwa Damon, CNN, Svalbard, Norway.
So that's an example of a, a government, in this case the Norwegian government, that is actually taking it so seriously that they've set aside money and have asked scientists from around the world to donate seeds, to go out and collect and donate seeds of all, all sorts of species to have them there. Not only there, there's a few other seed banks, but that's kind of the mother, uh, the mother seed bank uh, for the world. But they're trying to duplicate those seed banks in other places, just in case something happens to that bank, then at least they've got other ones. And again, what you have to re remember, once you lose a seed, that's it. You don't, you can't, can't go to Bunnings and buy another one. It's gone forever. It becomes extinct. So whether it's a tomato seed or a cucumber seed, once it's gone, it's gone forever. Again, it's something that we as consumers kind of don't think about because we just assume that oh, someone will have it somewhere. But as we, we see that the climate begins to change, uh, and we don't know the consequences of those changes, we're trying to, you know, um, make ourselves as resilient as we possibly can. So the alternative to this and the question we ask is why not just simply go organic? Uh, two problems. The first one is cost. It's, it's going to be more expensive. Is the consumer prepared to pay more for, let's say, an organic cotton t-shirt? Uh, is the company prepared to make a lower profit margin on, on that? And are farmers prepared to produce organic cotton? Remember, organic cotton doesn't use pesticides, so a lot more bugs uh, will attack it. Therefore, the yields will be much lower. And that's why the farmers have to uh, pay a higher price. Yeah, they charge a higher price for it, excuse me. If you have a look there at the chart, India is almost 50, 51% of Indian of India's crop is organic, followed by China, Kyrgyzstan, etc. It constitu it's growing, but it constitutes a fairly small portion of global demand, uh, global supply of cotton, but it is growing. So perhaps it is the future, perhaps we'll see more of it. And I'll, in the next few weeks, I'll show you examples of brands that are certainly moving in that direction. Of organic cotton and it only takes a few of the major brands the H&M's the Zara's to adopt it that we start to see perhaps a significant shift towards organic cotton but check out this this page so this is just an organization that promotes organic cotton there's a number of different ones out there and should we as a brand associate ourselves with this organization again going back to the idea of holistic supply chains and grouping ourselves together. There's a couple in there, I won't go into them at this stage, but you can check them out if it's of interest to you. Uh, if we go to the planetary boundaries and soil, back to the growing of cotton, uh, I'll just show you this chart here. If you follow the red line, the red line represents, this is the Amazon forest in Brazil, or sorry, total cotton production area in Brazil. And the production is in the red, as you can see, relative, consistent until about 95, and then it took off. And that, that taking off is with the introduction of more efficient ways of producing um, cotton, such as genetically modified cotton, for instance. The blue line represents uh, area, land area, farmland area. So what we start to find is a reduction in the amount of area being used, but an increase in yield. So it, it just gives you an example of the power of technology to increase yields and using less land, which, which arguably is a good thing from the land system change perspective, particularly when the land is being changed from rainforest to, um, Amazon rainforest into agricultural production. So just an argument in that favor. Um, the cotton cycle itself is takes 168, 160 days to grow. So it's a fairly long period of time. And you've got to remember during that, the, the life of the cotton, it's susceptible to all the pest diseases, climatic changes, heavy rainfalls or no rainfall, frosts, etc. So, um, Obviously, science does whatever it can to try to protect and nurture 
that crop for that 160 60 days. Uh, in terms of those yields that I just mentioned before, part of it, as I said, was genetically modified. The other part is fertilizers. And we've discussed fertilizers before, and we know from a planetary boundary point of view that the nitrogen and phosphorus cycles are way out of balance uh, because of the concentration or yields of it. So as a brand, um, do we go looking for cotton farms that don't use much fertilizer? or have a farm which somehow uses the, the a biodynamic farm, which perhaps has cows and pigs and other animals on the farm, that they then use that fertilizer, or that manure, I should say, to apply to the cotton, cotton farm, rather than get it from a factory and have these sorts of um, imbalances occur where it moves into the red, red zone. But in short, if you want cheap cotton, you need to use fertilizer to do it. If you don't use fertilizer, the price goes up. Pesticides, I'll just quickly go through these. So more chemical pesticides are used for cotton than for any other crop. Now, this is when you start looking at pesticides and cotton production, there's a whole range of claims, counterclaims and whatever. So all of these I always take with a, a grain of salt. But cotton accounts for 16% of global insecticide release, so it's quite a significant amount. And the big one is um, that everyone knows about, or you'll come across if you do research in this area, is aldicarp. And as it says here, a single drop of aldicarp absorbed through the skin can kill an adult. Obviously, it's diluted with water before it's applied, so it's not as if it's, it's raining poison. In, in high concentrates. Cotton pesticides so toxic that they were banned under the Soviet regime, and that's saying something because the Soviet Union wasn't sort of famous for caring about its people. Uh, it's still being used in Uzbekistan, and Uzbekistan is the world's second largest cotton exporter. So uh, just consider it from a public relations perspective, a bit like the Rana Plaza collapse. What happens if your brand is found to be sourcing its cotton from Uzbekistan and Uzbekistan is found to be um, using high concentrations of pesticides, it won't look good for your brand. So understanding where the cotton comes from, where the raw material comes from, is important. Pesticides can prevent individual nerve cells from communicating with one another. Effects also include impaired memory, severe depression, disruption of the immune system, paralysis and death. So in short, as you know, don't drink pesticides. Not good for you. Okay, if let's have. I just want to present to you the application of pesticides uh, from a developed and developing country point of view. And if you look on the right hand side of the screen where it's got developed, you'll see that the pesticide is applied with an aircraft, so it only needs one person. Uh, the spray is released from the back of the aircraft, so the pilot's at the front, nice and safe, is not exposed to it at all, flies over and sprays quite efficiently in that field. In the developing country, however, look at these guys here. They're, they're walking through the field, they're spraying. They've got no, no face protection, so they're inhaling some of the pesticides as they're walking through. They're also spraying in front of them. So they spray and then walk through where they've just sprayed as well. It's not even behind them. Um, so, you, you know, it's too simplistic to say all pesticide is bad. You know, that's one issue is, is how much pesticide we use, but also you've got to look at how it's applied onto the, the field. And remember, that's part of your brand supply chain. The application of pesticides on your cotton for your T-shirts is just as important as how toxic the pesticide is itself. So again, what, what you might do and what some brands do then is say, well, uh, we'll ensure in their contracts with these farmers, we'll, we will ensure that they've used appropriate uh, protective measures when they spray their crops. Another problem with uh, pesticides and planetary boundaries is biosphere integrity. If you recall what that was, that's about biodiversity. And obviously, the objective of pesticides is to kill everything else except for the cotton plant. And 
uh, Johan Rockström's position is that you need diversity in biodiversity in uh, organisms, in life on Earth, to have a, a healthy ecosystem. So where's the balance? How much should we kill and how much should we not oops, kill in there? And once again, it's the same trade-off. If you want cheap cotton, you've got to kill everything that's on that field because you just want cotton to grow and nothing else. If you want a healthy pr uh, planet, you've got to allow some organisms on there, but then the price is going to go up. Uh, from a human perspective, it's just as bad, however. A good example here was research done by Mancini uh, in the paper titled Acute Pesticide Poisoning Among Female and Male Cotton Growers in India, where you had what they discovered, it was in a particular village, it was the application of pesticides, pretty much like I've just shown you in the picture um, beforehand. And the cotton farmers, mostly the men, because it was the men that were doing the work of spraying, got sick. And there was a series, what this report goes into, uh, or this research goes into, um, is the knock-on effects. So what happens when the, the men got sick is the women had to take the roles of the men and work on the fields. What that then meant was there was no one to look after the children or the grandparents then had the burden of having to look after the children. And so it started changing the entire dynamic of the social structure within those communities uh, and put an enormous amount of pressure on on those communities as they tried to adapt to you know the change where dad can't work anymore because he's sick and he needs to be looked after. There was issue with health, access to doctors, income went down, and it just um, created a whole whole range of problems. So what starts as something as simple as sort of getting up in the morning and, and spraying some cotton ends up having some pretty significant um, uh, social challenges within a community. And that, as Kate Raworth suggests, keeps people in critical human deprivation. Remember, we humans like stability. We like things to be the same. It's only when we have certainty that we're comfortable and we prosper. We don't seem to do too well with uncertainty. Water. Uh, we've looked at fresh water use before in the planetary boundaries. The problem with cotton is it uses an enormous amount of water. And again, um, you'll, you'll see all sorts of figures bandied around with this. So this is just one figure out there. It can take up to 20,000 litres of water. That's, that's that water tank there to produce one kilo of cotton equivalent to a t-shirt and a pair of jeans. So, so you, if water is scarce and you're growing cotton, or if water is scarce in that country that you're growing cotton, that perhaps you and a brand, you as a brand may be deemed to be an irresponsible purchaser. Because why should you take water that could be used to grow food crops um, and using it to grow cotton crops, for instance? I'll, I'll just show you how the water is applied on a farm so you can see. I'll jump. Sorry. Oh, you don't need the music. I'll go through it. I'll just jump through some parts so you can see. So pre-watering, they flood the field. Uh, this is in Australia. Australia is one of the most efficient cotton producers in the world. They flood the field with water first, then they plant the seeds, flood it once again. Um, so an enormous around, when they flood, there's there's like a 75% evaporation rate of water into the atmosphere. So only 25% actually goes, in, stays in the ground, the rest floats up. Now this is just tilling to make sure that there's no no weeds and stuff between there. Again, if we look at it, the capital intensive activity, one person to to cultivate that entire field. You don't need people because they're relying on technology to do it. Super efficient, not competing with anything else. There's no patches anywhere. Um, as I said, that's why Australia is one of the most efficient producers of cotton because it's if they do decide to use a certain amount of land to grow cotton, they use all of it efficiently. Then comes the 
pesticides sprayed on it to make sure there's nothing else living there. And then comes the snow. And then once again, one person harvesting that snow and then what looks like a giant machine that I think looks like it's laying an egg, basically. And there's your cotton production. So absolutely amazing uh, and efficient method of doing so. The question then becomes, what impact does it have on people? What impact it has on the environment as well? Okay, one example where it has gone um, south or it's gone poor is in the Aral Sea, which was part of the Soviet Union at that stage. Um, that's the entire Aral Sea there. And what happened there is they started growing cotton and using the water because it's a freshwater, freshwater sea, if you like. And they started pumping water from the Aral Sea to cultivate the, the cotton. Um, the end result of that is you had images, fantastic images like this, where you've got ships which are basically stranded because they pumped so much water out of out of the sea at so quickly uh, that it just left ships sitting there as such. Even since they've stopped uh, the growing of cotton and they've stopped pumping the, the water out of the sea, the water hasn't returned. So it's an example of when an ecosystem changes, it's not as if you can say, okay, we'll stop doing that and therefore it's going to revert back to normal that's not the case it just doesn't once an eco ecosystem changes it changes into something else or as uh, Johan Rockström suggests beyond the zone of certainty now, we'll look at that in a bit more detail in the shoots as well but just to give you an example of the sea in 1957 I oh, so sorry I was going to say um, it's about I think it was about half the size of Tasmania. I can't remember this, the size of the RLC now. It was significant. 1957, and then by 82, you started to see a significant drawing down of, of the water. And again, it's a bit like the negative feedback before. Once, once it gets on a roll, this change in an ecosystem, it doesn't stop. It will just continue to decline. And whereas now there's absolutely a really small amount of water and they're trying to restore it slowly by building that dam the cock Aral dam um, and preserving the northern part of the Aral sea but it's not going back as it was as i said in the truths we'll look at the health effects uh, that occurred as a result of this but it's probably one of the best examples of human in intervention into an ecosystem and how the changes are permanent in Australia, from an Australian perspective, if you are going to source cotton from Australia, what you've got to worry about, so, uh, sorry, most of the cotton is grown around um, uh, southern Queensland and northern New South Wales, although because of the warmer conditions, we're seeing farmers starting to grow cotton around the Victorian border now, uh, and they get their water from the Murray-Darling system, which we looked at, I think it was week two, I think we had a bit of a look at the Murray-Darling system and ask the question, who should get the water? Cubby Station is the biggest cotton farm in Australia and it's the one that attracts the most uh, contention because basically uh, other farmers are complaining that it's taking so much of the water that so water flows down, sorry, from Queensland down to Adelaide in that direction. All the farmers from New South Wales and Adelaide and, and some in Victoria aren't getting as much water because it's being used by Cubby Station. And these are farms that grow food, the uh, dairy products, etc. So we have to consider the pros and cons as a brand of sourcing cotton from perhaps a cubby station or a similar one, because by sourcing from them, we're actually impacting on farmers further downstream. Do we want to be in that position or not? Are we comfortable with it? These are decisions we have to make as a, as a brand. Um, and there's a whole issue around that Four Corners report if you want to have a look at that one. From, um, as I said before about capital and labour intensive, we can go f on the right hand side for the developed world where I said Australia is the most efficient producer of cotton in the world. 
do we source from Australia under the grounds that we're saying, well, at least when Australian farmers use land, land system change, they're using it the, at, at the absolute maximum point of efficiency. Or alternatively, and just as valid, we can say, do we, we go to the developing world where they employ a lot of people and pick cotton manually as these three women are doing here at the moment and base our brand around that decision or partly around that decision. There's no rights or wrongs. It's about finding a morality that, that's in line with your philosophy as a brand and your individual philosophy as well as a human. And that's where we're seeing more and more companies sort of um, work themselves out trying to find a position. So lessons to be learnt. Um, I'm going to show you the wool industry. In Australia, the wool industry um, in the past was, sorry, the Australian wool industry had a significant impact on global wool supplies and the fashion industry globally as well. And over time, that has diminished. As we can see, production in, in Australia is pretty significant, 20%. Used to be more, but China's growing quite rapidly. And so Australia is losing part of its authority in this field. One of the big issues for wool was this mulesing, where it's, a, it's an agricultural practice where to, to stop the, the sheep being infected by um, fly, fly strike, if you like, which, which occurs around the anus of the sheep, the farmers would cut the skin of, of the sheep around the anus which is mulesing, and then when it heals, it heals kind of like a, a leathery um, patch where wool doesn't grow, and therefore the flies can't plant their, um, their eggs in that area. It was the most effective way from the farmer's point of view, they would say it was the most effective way to stop the animal from uh, living a, a pretty uncomfortable life and a, a, a pretty unpleasant death as it was infected by the sheep's eggs, by the, um, well, by the infection. Uh, the, the animal rights group PETA got onto this and said this is um, cruelty to animals. And, and initially what the farmers said, well, there's no alternative to this. This is a practice we've been doing for 100 years. It works. Um, and short of any other way, we're going to keep doing it. PETA said, no, you're not and started a campaign, a global campaign, against Australian wool because Australian wool uh, represented cruelty to animals. And one of the problems Australian uh, wool producers had was that PETA comes out of Los Angeles. It's funded primarily by the, or significantly by the Hollywood film industry. And there's one thing the Hollywood film industry does really well, and that is promote a message globally. And so slowly but surely, major European fashion brands started sort of backing off wool, particularly Australian wool and fine, fine merino wool, which is the best class of wool because of the association with this. So there was a lot of um, contention about which way the Australian wool industry should go. But because of that ongoing debate, basically wool lost, lost ground around the world. Because of it. So it was a good example of how an industry has to be aware of public um, perceptions of groups that sort of argue against uh, certain practices and as such. Anyway, as a consequence of that, you started to see new wool standards emerge around the world. So the responsible wool standard came out of um, Argentina. And so they set a standard on how to look after sheep which does not include in, include mulesing. Uh, and so farmers can sign into that. The New England uh, Sustain Wool is another scheme we, uh, set up in New South Wales, and that's attracting certain farmers who, you know, if you want that stamp, you basically have to raise your sheep in a particular way. And then there's some examples of how they tried to manage the fly strike that occurs. What we see uh, with Bio Design Challenge is um, a student, students being uh, put into, in, into competition, competing with each other, excuse me. 
what we see with the bio design challenge is students being um, put into competition to come up with new innovative ways of creating uh, wool made products that aren't cruel to animals for instance so it's just an example of kind of uh, uh, being aware of all of the external factors that might, might influence the brand and get once again a bit like the Rana Plaza collapse you don't want to be the brand whose label is found at the bottom of the factory okay, if we look at the BCI cotton initiative and this is probably probably the entry point now for a lot of brands it's where what they do is they find a third party like BCI um, cotton and what these organizations do is they will go and find look at the practices of certain farms uh, cotton farms and then decide whether that uh, aligns with their values as you can see here from these six values which we'll look at in the tutorials in a little bit more detail and then give it the stamp of approval so all brands have to do such as these brands down here is simply look for cotton um, that has B BCI approved standard on it Kmart as you can see just there Kmart has now adopted the BCI standard which has been doing so for maybe two years three years at the moment and the big brands H&M Katmandu etc are also doing it uh, the advantage of this system is it allows Kmart to still be Kmart to focus on product development and retail and not have to worry about um, uh, expanding their head office expertise in terms of how cotton is grown and where it's grown they leave it up to someone else so as I say it's it's a good entry point into the market a few problems with it which we'll discuss later on H&M goes one step further if we look at the H&M group and they have they've been ranked in the top three in sustainable cotton ranking this year which let's have a look at this ranking um, again Adidas comes in as, at number one is the most uh, advanced when it comes to policy uptake and traceability of their supply chain so uptake which I suppose you could convert into enthusiasm would be uh, their forte and they certainly are enthusiastic as to what they're doing with cotton which means we as a brand look towards Adidas see what they're doing and see what parts of their their strategy perhaps we could adopt and those parts we shouldn't adopt IKEA and then up there's H&M as well now why this is important is because as I said previously when you've got major global brands like H&M starting to declare that they're going to take seriously where their cotton comes from that has a knock-on effect throughout the entire industry so you don't want to be the brand that's left behind saying well we don't really care where the cotton comes from you should just focus on on um, buying our product simply based on the the aesthetic qualities of the garment not good enough anymore you've got to be more holistic in that and so as you can see if we go right down to the bottom here they also list the companies with zero score because they didn't contribute anything and so once again it's a kind of um, it's a shame game forever 21 is in there as well as one Giorgio Armani is in there. it doesn't mean they're not doing good things they're just not declaring them or not making them public uh, and as I said before in an era of transparency uh, the name of the game is openness what are you doing so we watch H&M to see what they're doing uh, last one I'll look at oops sorry the next one I'll look at is the cotton on group and if we look here they've got the good and we're committed to creating positive change for you for your, for our community for the planet for the things that matter to all of us that's our word that's the good so here's a brand that has a mission statement beyond us simply saying we're going to provide clothes for for Australians or for people around the world at reasonable prices and where does the journey start it starts on the farm obviously cotton on the brand relies on cotton so it makes sense to focus on that and what are they doing on the farm read more we shall oops where is it where is it come on there we go so BCI cotton 2016 we proudly became the f one of the first Australian retailers to join the BCI 
So as I said, it's good, but it's not great. BCI doesn't mean organic, by the way. It just means better standards for the farmers. Another one of their goals, their good goals, 100% sustainable cotton by 2021. And they've got the Kenyan Cotton Initiative, which I'll just show you the little video on it. We launched our own, but this is an important point. We launched our own sustainable cotton a program in Kuala in Kenya. So they've gone beyond the Kmart model of simply sourcing BCI cotton. They're actually investing time and money in the production of cotton. And how they do that... Oops, oops, oops. <laughs> I thank Cotton Horn and other donors, all well-wishers in all over the Kenya to grow cotton because if they grow cotton, the economy of this country will come higher. I am a farmer growing cotton in Kwale, Kenya. So you'll notice with that image... Kenya. Growing cotton in. You'll notice with that image, very uh, 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 different to the Australian cotton farm, which was very large, um, perfect. It was exactly, uh, it had been laser leveled, so it's flat, no wastage, no weeds, nothing. You've got this farm, which is more, if you like, organic, more natural. And all of the images in this video were all about people. So it fits into Kate, Kate Raworth's model of societal change and empowering people um, to, to move out of that critical deprivation stage right in the center. And this is how Cotton On's doing it. So going there, giving uh, training, perhaps some money, I'm not quite sure, uh, in assisting these farmers. So it's definitely uh, uh, adopting the, capital, uh, the labor intensive approach to cotton production. And if we, if you recall last week when we looked at migration flows, or excuse me, refugee flows around the world, um, if people can make a living at home in their own country, they, don't, you know, they won't leave their country. Nobody wants to leave their country and endure the hardships of that goes with being a refugee. They only do it because they have to. So here's an example of cotton on. Uh, trying to create a positive environment in Kenya, which encourages people to stay home uh, and develop their own economies and skills there. Given that, so, so Cotton On represents uh, a new brand, uh, globally ambitious. It's based in Geelong. It was created in Geelong, based in Geelong, but they've got retail stores all over the world now and it's it's wanting to grow so watching this brand and what it does is uh, both fascinating and important to understand trends that may be set um if we look at etico for instance and what we find so etico is a melbourne-based company it's been around for a long time very small range you know base pretty much basics underwear t-shirts as such but their primary objective as it says here um, has always been about how can we create a range or how can we um, maintain a business that is if you like ethical and what does that mean so they've over many years have been exploring what sustainable it is what, what ethical is so they're a really good company to watch and understand from a boutique point of view if you want to be a small scale uh, business and you can still succeed within this sort of ethical framework. And so they talk about, you know, Etico, oops, Etico is about living conscientiously. We make decisions and purchases that do not harm people, animals, or the earth. Etico was founded on these principles, and we continue to search for new ways to improve the way we operate. So again, you can see how it sort of dovetails into planetary boundaries and the social economy or the donut economics. Uh, when it comes to uh, cotton, it's basically they go for organic cotton is what they look for. That's their way of, of um, 
ensuring they don't damage anything. And you've got things like Wear No Evil, which I think is quite an interesting um, slogan. They have their No Animal Glues. They don't try to be everything. They can't because they're a boutique brand. But they try to consider every input that goes into their into their garments. Um, so that's kind of at the small scale and as simple as finding organic cotton to use. At the other end of the scale, we have uh, Patagonia, which is probably the benchmark. It's, it's the go-to company if you want to know uh, where the fashion industry is at its most advanced when it comes to sustainability, then probably Cotton On is, uh, sorry, Patagonia is the one to look at. And starting with um, the, the question that they pose there, regenerative cotton organic, why? They've gone well beyond simply sourcing organic cotton. They've gone into actually understanding um, soil dynamics, soil chemistry, and understanding what it means to have healthy soil, because ultimately you need a healthy land to be able to grow, grow the food. So it's a much, much deeper approach than simply sourcing organic cotton. And what it needs, it's a uh, nature way, where is it? So they're linking it to climate change, where is it? As you notice here, big agricultural agriculture is broken. So the Monsanto model that I showed you before is something that Patagonia don't does not accept. It says that's not the way to do things. So they're quite revolutionary in rejecting big business and big, big ways of doing it. And that's why they're an interesting brand to follow because they're not a boutique brand. They're quite a big company. And if, um, if there is another way to produce food and to produce cotton crops, etc. Well, then Patagonia then might be part of that model. Well, certainly would show the way, if it's possible at all. Uh, soil's a solution because healthy soil traps carbon. That's CO2 emissions. We haven't spoken about how carbon is stored in soil, but that's probably, we've, I've shown you how it's stored in trees, uh, not so much in soil itself. That's a whole nother level, but um, that's also a significant uh, carbon sink. We believe this farming method has the potential to change the way we grow food and fibre, restore the health of our soil and climate. Again, these are all watchable, so if these are things you're, you're interested in, what we're doing and why. 2017, we helped establish the organic certification. So this is their own certification. I think I've told you before, many brands are starting to sort of um, present their own standards or create their own standards in a hope that other brands will follow them. So we're in a competition at the moment to see who can come up with the standard for the industry. A holistic agricultural certification encompassing pasture-based animal welfare, fairness for the farmer, so um, animal rights, human rights and workers, and robust requirements for soil health and land management, so respect for the planet. So once again, that's where that holistic model comes from. Um, cover crops, compost. So once again, you know, we're at a website of a fashion brand, Patagonia, but we're, you know, we're, we're talking about farming and agriculture. You know, I don't see a garment for sale or a, a, a reduced price for a garment in any of this at the moment. That's why they're quite an interesting brand to look at to sort of give perhaps inspiration and direction. And again, we'll be looking at that in more detail going forward. Fair, fair Trade's the last one I'll show you. And this has been around for a long time. You've probably seen it. Oh, yeah, it was, was there. I didn't think I had it. Um, been around for a long time. You've probably seen that logo on coffee. If you've been to a cafe, you would have seen it. Again, it's, it's a bit like um, the BCI cotton, a third party that goes around, uh, it has a standard for what fairness in the production of cotton should look like, what a fair wage should be, what fair hours worked should be, um, fair practices in that industry. They give a stamp of approval to that farm and then 
they give you that list and you go off and source from cotton from a fair trade farm or you source fair trade cotton itself and then it goes into how it does it. Fair bit of criticism because um, it's been around for a long time. It, it, obviously, the Fair Trade Association has to keep going back to check the practices in these farms to ensure that they comply. And that's where the criticism comes in. They don't, they may not necessarily do it often enough or thoroughly enough. And so basically when the fair trade people are coming to the farm, everything looks wonderful and perfect. As soon as the fair trade people leave, then the perhaps not so pleasant standards sort of kick back in and whatever. So with all of these associations, you as a manager have to ask, you know, to what extent do these organisations monitor the standards and ensure that the standards are kept. That's why you're starting to see um, brands develop their own standards like Cotton On and The Good or as I just said with Patagonia because they're not trusting, they're going beyond trusting third party standards as well. Because remember, you trust that standard then your brand is, and the goodwill of your brand is dependent on another brand, Fair Trade Australia, in this case. Okay, so to finish off then, uh, <laughs> the synthetics, I'll just remind you about this. I understand, understand you did this in materials. So is this a, a future totally closed loop system where uh, the production of the wood, the pulping, the processing, the turning it into fibres, the wastes from that process are all kept within its own ecosystem at Lenzig there, uh, it doesn't get out. Uh, perhaps that's the future and not going towards organic or anything like that. So an alternative, as you can see here, as part of Lenzig's um, goals, they incorporate the STGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. That's where I said you'll start to see these tiles appear on different companies' um, annual reports as they start to link in what they do in their business with what the United Nations standards for the STG goals are. It's just another way to go, just as valid as organic or even genetically modified. Okay, in summary then, we started off by saying uh, we've got a very simple decision to make. Do we go for natural? Do we go for synthetic? And and then started to discover that it's not so simple. It depending depends on a whole range of issues, uh, social, political, that are out there that align with our brand. And we finished off by looking at what some companies are doing out there from you know, those way in front, such as Patagonia, the ambitious brands like Cotton On and the boutique brands like Etico, and how all three are um, all moving in that direction in various ways all signifying that that is definitely a trend. How it evolves, we don't know yet, but certainly to ignore that trend of being concerned about who grows the cotton and how it's grown um, is what a brand would do at their own detriment. Okay, thank you, that's it for this week. So next week we'll go into the actual processing of the fibers themselves, um, but you should be considering what raw material to use in the making of your clothes. Catch you next week. Thank you.